Hello, all you positive heads out there. Thanks for tuning your beautiful brainwaves into the Positive Head Podcast, where you can always count on hearing fascinating discussions and interviews with the best and brightest consciousness change makers that are out there working tirelessly to help catalyze change and expand awareness all across Spaceship Earth. And if you enjoy the Positive Head podcast, please be sure to follow us on iTunes by subscribing there and also be sure to leave us a good review. In the podcast world, good reviews and subscribers on iTunes really are the holy grail. The more subscribers and good reviews you get, the more exposure you get. So if you love the show or even just like it a little bit, (laughs) please subscribe and give us a good review on iTunes. I assure you the support will be much appreciated and I'm confident the good karma gods will rain blessings down upon thee for doing so. Uh, Also, if you haven't been over to PositiveHead.com lately, we have some really cool new things going on. I'm super excited to announce the launch of our new line of t-shirts. Of course, we printed up the typical stuff you'd expect, Positive Head tees with our super cool Flower of Life inspired logo, but we also have some very unique tees that have chemistry quotes on them. Now, I'm sure you're probably thinking, what the heck is a chemistry quote? Well, chem quotes are clever and insightful quotations written out in equation form that cause a person to take a few seconds to try and interpret the message when they see them. If you're wearing one, it's going to catch people's attention. They're going to have to take a few seconds to try and interpret what the heck your shirt actually says. Once they actually do interpret it, it'll instantly release feel-good chemicals in their brain because it's a feel-good message. And as a result, you'll have helped us achieve our primary goal of spreading the positivity simply by wearing an awesome t-shirt. Clever, huh? So in support of our t-shirt line launch, we're currently doing a crazy good deal where if you buy a t-shirt, you get a free positive head bracelet with it. We're only charging $19 for t-shirts during this promo. Since the bracelet normally sells for $15, it's a pretty amazing deal uh, to get both for only $19. So in addition to subscribing to the podcast on iTunes, don't be scared to show us some love and support by going to positivehead.com to get your delicious positive head t-shirt and bracelet combo meal while they're still hot and while supplies last. All right, all you positive heads out there. On this episode, I'm very happy to have with me mind hacker extraordinaire, Sir John Hargrave. I'm really excited to pick John's brain because I just recently completed his spectacular new book titled Mind Hacking, and I have a lot of questions for him. Uh, It was an excellent, excellent read that truly is self-help in every sense of the word. I had so many great takeaways from it. So uh, yeah, thanks for joining me. Welcome to the show, John. Hey, thanks, Brandon. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, likewise. Very, very excited to have you. So first things first, are you, I have to ask, are you a sir in that you've been knighted, uh, in the knighted, you've been knighted since or in the respect your elders since? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, well, it's a funny story. I, uh, I, I've always wanted to be Sir John Hargrave, because I just thought it sounded classier, don't you? <laughs> oh, it's very, very classy. I actually, it's funny you should mention that because I wore a tie for this podcast just, you know, because. <laughs> and, I could uh, tell. I could tell. You, <laughs> yeah, you, you could hear I'm a little choked up. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I wrote the Queen of England a few years back and I said, Your Majesty, I'd really like to be knighted. And uh, uh-huh. she wrote me back and she said, Well, you have to do something noble. And I was uh-huh. like, that's a lot of work. Uh-huh. So I, f- <laughs> I found out you can actually go down to your local county courthouse and you can apply to have your name legally changed. Small fee. Uh, you go in for the judge. And uh, so I did it. And here I am today before you, Sir John Hargrave and uh, kind of a name hack. If you will. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Hold on. So you actually hacked the the sir process. I like it. I like it. What a great <laughs> what a great way to start. Okay, guys. So you get you get a glimpse of what we're talking about here. Um, a little bit of shortcut there. It's really really uh, funny. Now tell us a little bit aside from being a sir. Tell me a little bit about your background. Perhaps you could uh, share your interesting story. You have a very interesting story at the beginning of the book where you had a run-in with federal authorities that actually uh, kind of started you down this path. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So in the first chapter of mind hacking, I won't give away the whole story, but uh, the Secret Service showed up on my doorstep, and you know. Brandon, when the Secret Service are in your living room, it's probably a good sign that something is is gone wrong in your life. Yeah. And so 
Uh, I really used that opportunity to make a lot of changes. I was uh, I was drinking a lot, and I basically said, you know what, I, I this is <laughs> it's kind of a sign that things need to change, and uh, and so I I decided to throw away all my alcohol and drugs that night and uh, in a dumpster, and I found, and anybody who has tried to overcome any habit or or start something new in their lives, start a business or just change their mind, knows that dealing with your mind is one of the most difficult things because your mind wants to talk you out of it, right? And that was what was happening right. was if I thought about what I was doing, my mind would say, are you crazy? You can't throw this stuff away. Think of all the good times mm-hmm. you've had. Right, right, but right. If I, just, if I just focused on the muscle movement, like literally one step at a time, so just kind of put my mind on hold, focused on the muscle movement, I was able to do it. And it was the most difficult thing I've ever done. But what I learned out of that process was that you can hack your mind. In other words, your brain can be reprogrammed. And over the subsequent months, I basically started learning and collecting these hacks or these techniques of dealing Mm -hmm. with my mind to reprogram it, to have better habits of thought, not only to stay sober, but to really propel my life in awesome new directions. And all of us can do that. That's what mind hacking is all about. Right, right. So as far as mind hacking and how it works for, for you, it you just started down the path of kind of really paying close attention to your mind. And, and in the book, you mention you were predisposed to kind of look at things in that way as a, a programmer, correct? That's, that's a little bit of your background is in computer programming. Yeah, I'm a geek. So I had one of the <laughs> first personal computers, uh, the Commodore 64. And Brandon, I love that machine. I, you know, I would have <laughs> I had it in my bedroom and I would have slept with it at night, except it had like hard plastic angular <laughs> corners. Um, otherwise, that can, I that can hurt if you roll over too quickly in the middle of the night. That's right. It's not good for spooning. <laughs> no, so exactly. <laughs> So I love this computer and I, I learned programming from an early age and uh, and because I've worked in technology since then, I really grew to view the world through this kind of lens of technology. But we all are in a screen all the time nowadays. So we all are familiar with this universe that's within the computer. And in many ways, that world of the computer is like the world of our mind because the world it's inside your screen it's not like the physical world right it's not tangible and yet it has a reality to it and in the same way the world of our minds it's not a physical reality but it still has this very powerful reality behind it in other words your mind is like the operating system of your life and if you can start to debug the code like a programmer debugs uh uh the program then you can really start to change your thought loops and change your life. Excellent. Now, what what is the first steps for someone who's interested in hacking their mind? Um, what would you, you know, obviously in your case, uh, it's pretty extreme. I don't think we want everyone to have to go through a uh, federal agent showing up at their door to <laughs> lead them down that path. What no. for, for the more... Uh, the, for people who aren't a sir or <laughs> haven't been knighted, what would they do uh, to start down this road? So the first step is really gaining awareness of your mind. And I know that's something that we talk about on this podcast, but it's really about learning to see your mind. So one of the first hacks in the book is um, a, a little technique called what was my mind just thinking? And the idea mm-hmm. is as many times throughout the day for the rest of the day you ask yourself what was my mind just thinking and you approach it like a video game so you give yourself an awareness point every time that you remember to check in on your mind and then you write down your score at the end of the day and what it does is most people find it easy for about an hour and then they forget because they get lost in the movie they get lost in their own mental uh, yeah. processes. and But what it does is it starts to teach you that skill of stepping back from your mind, which we sometimes talk about like getting into super user mode. Like, you know, on a computer, you have like your regular user accounts 
with like limited permissions, but then you have these super user accounts that can kind of oversee the whole system. And that's what we want to do with our minds is is get to a place where we can be thinking about our own thinking. That's the skill we have to learn. Absolutely. It reminds me a little bit of um, the book Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. I don't know if you're yeah. familiar with that or not. Yeah, he great talks book. about yeah, he talks about that same kind of thing and from a little different angle uh, than the way you're approaching it, but in a lot of ways, very, very similar. Uh, you know, he had the experience of being suicidal and, you know, thinking just very, very depressed and down and, you know, thinking I can't live with myself anymore. And then having the realization, hold on, who can't live with whom? And that implies that there's more than one of me. And it just led to this great realization and that the, he is you know, there's, there's mul multiple parts, the observer, uh, you know, kind of watching that's been there from the time you were five years old and is there when you're 95 years old, that's unchanging and unmoving and just kind of watching, uh, you know, your life play out. And it led to this great realization and a, a great book too. So I, I recommend that to people, but that's what it makes me think of, you know, when you, when you're talking about it. And I, I really like the fact that you're approaching the same kind of thing from a much more, you know, programmer kind of scientific uh, way of dealing with it. It's it's interesting because, of course, different things resonate different with different people. So, yeah. So you talk about concentration training as being, uh, I like how you say it, it's being like Jedi training in the Star Wars movies. Mm -hmm. Now, isn't that very similar to meditation? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so so we call it concentration training in the book. It's a little bit different from meditation, and I've been practicing this for probably twenty years. Um, the way that we recommend do it, uh, doing it is in the morning. You spend about twenty minutes focusing on your breath, and you know you spend the first two or three minutes just relaxing your body uh, from top to bottom, and then you focus on the breath. And when you notice yourself lost in thought you award yourself a point. So again, it's kind of gamifying the meditation mm -hmm. experience. So what happens is in, in traditional meditation, I found that there's a kind of sense of like, oh, I failed because I just caught myself thinking. But when you do it this way, you get a little dopamine hit because you realize, oh, I'm rewarding myself because I just caught myself thinking. And that really is the point of it, again, is, is developing that awareness of the mind. So if you can say, hey, I just caught myself thinking, good for me, <laughs> good for you, mind, because you just like were able to pull yourself out of that for a second. That's what we want to do. And, you know, anybody who's practiced concentration training or meditation knows that what you get out of it is not just the 20 minutes that you spend in the morning, but it's really the rest of the day. It's that yeah. ability then to have greater clarity and again, awareness of what's going on in your mind so that when you think, start thinking negative or unhelpful or crazy thoughts that you can start to pull yourself back just like you do in that training and say, wait a minute, mind, <laughs> we don't have to right. think this anymore. And in other words, you don't, you don't have to believe everything you think. Right, right. I think that's a really interesting point that you bring up as well. You know, our our brains are drug factories, right? And you said yeah. you mentioned getting a dopamine hit, and it's such a smart way to approach, um, you know, training of any kind is is understanding our physiology, understanding our own inner you know reward system, and then using it to you know our advantage. And that's essentially what you're doing with this yeah, when you you know as you said gamifying it. You get that dopamine hit. You're giving yourself, you're making it into a game. And that seems to be such a um, powerful way to to do anything. And seems more and more people are are starting to realize that and use the, you know, how do we gamify whatever this is we're trying to yeah. accomplish so that people enjoy the process and and get that, uh, get that dopamine hit, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a really good point, Brandon. What we... So much of the book is about developing positive mental habits. And in order to develop habits, we have to have some kind of positive reward built in whenever we do it. And that reward, again, can be as simple as like, oh, I'm going to give myself a little mental point for that. But for example, one of the things we cite is research that was in uh, Charles Duhigg's book, The Power of Habit. And he 
talks about when you create a habit, you need a cue, which is something that reminds you to do the thing that you want to have as a habit. And you need a reward when it's done. So if you want to learn how, to, if you want to exercise more, when you get up in the morning, just put on your workout clothes. You don't even have to right. exercise. Just put on workout clothes. That's your cue. And then when you're done, you always have a consistent reward, like a smoothie or a shower or coffee or whatever. And so right. we say do the same thing with this concentration training or with meditation. Give yourself a consistent reward every time you've done that and withhold it on the days when you don't do it. That's the other part. And being consistent about that, you do start to develop that positive loop then that that gradually gets momentum and starts moving in really exciting directions absolutely yeah you, and you also had mentioned you know the re, the reward really comes after the 20 minutes and as someone who has a lot of energy and can can you know get uh, sort of hyper so to speak and mm. it gets i find the difference when i do start my day with a meditation yeah. it is this calm that you know pervasive throughout the whole day that otherwise I, you know, I normally don't have. And you start getting really addicted to that. You feel yeah. calmer, you feel more, you know, you're not stressing yourself out. And it just, it sets a tone that I think until you've actually had the experience, uh, you know, people just aren't aware of how powerful yeah. it is. It sounds so, you know, menial and unimportant and yeah, whatever, but it really sets a tone for your day that uh, changes the, the whole experience. Yeah, you notice it, right? And I mean, it's a lot like physical exercise. If you start your day with physical, you just have this energy throughout the day yeah. and it just starts Absolutely. things off on the right note. And I have a, a good friend who started this concentration training after she read my book and she's been doing it regularly. She's got a very high stress job uh, as a, a researcher at this this biotech company. And she said, you know, this is like I used to get so stressed about everything at my work. And now when yeah. these situations arise, I'm really able to like step back from it and just look at it much more dispassionately or just much more clearly from sort of like a right. higher level. Again, it's like that idea of metacognition. Observer. Yeah. Thinking about your own thinking. Right. Right. What a, what a cool thing to, you know, what great feedback for you, uh, you know, having someone read your book and come back to you and, having that sort of effect, that's uh, certainly something to be proud of. That's a positive loop right there. Having you talk yeah. about it, having exactly. you say, hey, I thought it was, it was pretty good. And that's like a positive loop as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, that's so funny that you say that because that leads me to my next question. You talk a lot about negative loops versus positive loops Can yeah. in the book. Can you explain the difference there? Yeah. So, you know, part one of this program is really about gaining that awareness of your mind. And part two is is about debugging or figuring out, again, like a programmer looks at, a, at, at, at computer code and figures out the problems. We call it debugging. What we're trying right. to do is look at our minds and say, well, where are the negative or unhelpful thoughts? And often if we can change those, it has this cascading effect in our lives. And again, in that book, The Power of Habit, he tells the story. I believe that it was a woman who uh, they were studying uh, a smoking cessation program. So she was a heavy smoker. She was overweight. She had like couldn't hold down a job, no relationships. And she stopped smoking. That was it. That was the negative habit that she cut out of her life. And then a year later, these researchers followed back up with the woman and they literally didn't recognize the woman who walked through the door because she had lost all this weight. She had a steady job. She had a new boyfriend. So all of these things, in addition to like st still not smoking, and he called that a keystone habit. The idea was when you have one of these negative loops in your life, and you take it away, suddenly it frees up all of this additional energy that you can use to then make all of these other changes. You see this a lot with alcoholics where, you know, and I'm a good example where, you know, when they stop drinking often, then a year or two later, you see them and they've lost weight and they're exercising and, you know, they've started a business and they're having the best sex of their lives. So right. it, it can have this like, that's not incentive. I don't know what is exactly. <laughs> so that's, that's the kind of thing that can happen when we get rid of those negative loops and start turning them into positive loops. 
Yeah, you in the, in the book you discuss, and I think you, if I recall, you use Bruce Lee as an example using uh, negative momentum against itself and like parlaying it into a positive statement. I <laughs> and I don't remember if you used Bruce Lee or someone had shown me a video in the last few days of Bruce Lee actually lighting a cigarette with lighting cigarettes or matches with his uh, nunchucks. And so I can't remember if I read you using him as an example or (laughs) not in the book. I think you did, but uh, there's been a lot of Bruce Lee in my life in the last few days, but I really, really resonated with that. Yeah. I think I can play off the Bruce Lee thing. I think, uh, I think I can work with that. You know, the part of the book I'm talking about where you, you talk about, Taking that negative momentum, whatever's happening, and just, you know, transferring it into a positive statement. Yeah, I talk about judo. Judo. And Ah, uh, it is this idea of, like, somebody rushes at the judo master. And instead of kind of resisting that, the judo master just lets the opponent's momentum kind of carry him away. So the judo master sort of calmly steps aside and the person swings away you know we were watching this documentary on the uh the probe that just went by uh, pluto and uh as the probe went by the gravity of jupiter they made it go super close to jupiter so that the uh the gravity actually like increased the speed of this thing as it like flew out of the jupiter orbit it increased the speed by like 20 percent, and it shaved like three years off of the the travel time of this uh, of this Pluto probe. So those are two examples of how like a negative thought loop can come to us. And with training, we can take that momentum and turn it back into a positive thought loop. So let me give you an example to make this a little more clear. Yes, that was coming now. So good. (laughs) I, I used to feel really awkward around people. So whenever I'd be talking to somebody, I'd be thinking about, like, am I standing up straight or do I have a piece of spinach in my teeth? And then I realized at some point, like, I've got this negative loop going on and it's like, I'm no good with people. That's the negative loop. And I'm like, well, what do I want? What I want is to feel comfortable around people. I want to feel like I'm good with people. So the new loop, the positive loop was I'm good with people. That's it. And I repeated that again and again and again. And then whenever I'd be talking with someone and I would start to feel that awkward self-consciousness, I would just Mm -hmm. say, wait a minute, I'm good with people. So that sort of like rush of energy comes on. And instead of like resisting and saying, oh, no, oh, well, well," you just kind of like calmly take that energy and just put it into this thought of I'm good with people. And over time at hundreds and thousands of repetitions of that thought, it turns out that I I am kind of good with people now. So yeah, yeah, (laughs) we can see the result here. Yeah. It's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it really works. It is. is. It's, it's fascinating. And, you know, I think there are some other examples in the book where, for example, let's say I think to myself, one of the issues I have is I can get easily agitated sometimes. And where, when I'm aware that I'm, being agitated, if I were to say, you know, I'm agitated, which leads me to instantly becoming deeply calm, right? If I were to, yeah. every time I realize I'm agitated, just kind of parlay it into that. I mean, that's, that's in a sense, doing the same thing is, is using the momentum of this negative thing and, and turning, leading it to a positive story, so to speak, right? Yeah, that's great. That's great. And I, I, I'll give you a similar hack that I've been using a lot recently, which is to say welcome. So to actually welcome the negative thought. So yeah. what we what we usually do is we sort of like resist or tense up when we have that like difficult thought. But if you just say welcome. So um, I'm also the CEO of Media Shower. We're a, a content marketing company. So we've got a lot of clients uh-huh. and, uh, you know, occasionally with any <laughs> with any company, you'll have difficult customers difficult clients of course and it used to like it, i mean it still does like it's difficult to deal with difficult people but now what i try to do instead of like getting angry or you know frustrated just welcome it say hey welcome anger welcome frustration and when you do that there's this immediate sense of like releasing the tension 
of that feeling. And then you can immediately channel that into something positive, like, okay, we can make this work. We can find a solution. You know, th- there is a way out of this difficult situation right here, but now I can focus on it because that negative thought has sort of, it's almost like you're a movie theater usher and you're taking tickets. And as these like right. thoughts come rushing by, you're like taking the ticket saying, thank you. And then you're just right. using that as a positive momentum. That's great. That's, that's really great. You, you talk in the book about a study at UCLA. Uh, and at that, in that study, it, they were basically comparing visualization versus mental simulations. I, I found this really, really interesting as someone who does a lot of visualizing. Uh, can you explain the difference between visualizing and running simulations and, and the results that they found? Yeah. How do you do your visualizing? I'm curious, Brandon. Can you share that with us? Yeah, you typically in like, I, I make it a part of my meditation, essentially. Yeah. So I'll, I'll meditate. I'll try and keep my mind quiet, you know, focus on breath and that sort of thing for 10 minutes or so. Once I'm in that, you know, meditative state is as, as, as meditative as I can get, you know, lots of thoughts coming in and, you know, ca- trying to snap back to, to, you know, not thinking or getting distracted. But after I really get into that calm space, then I will start just bringing up things that I want to experience that I want to manifest in my life and start um, thinking about them and then really trying to feel them, feel what it will feel like to have achieved them and just kind of, uh, you know, uh, play out, you know, the fantasy, so to speak, of what it will be like to have achieved them. Yeah. Have you had success with that? Like how long have you been doing it and what are the results you've seen? I'm curious. You know, I haven't been doing it really Uh, regimented for a long period of time. It's here and there. I mean, I've always been a dreamer. (laughs) I definitely fall into the category of that, that kind of person. So a lot of my life has been, here's what I want to do. And I'm excited about it. And I'm talking about it a lot. And I'm got all this, you know, energy surrounding it. So I guess in that sense, I've in, in, in always, uh, you know, very, the eternal optimist as, uh, you know, I've had (laughs) relatives refer to me. So I guess I've been doing it my whole life in that sense, but very recently in the last maybe um, year or so trying to bring it into a meditation, but, but sporadically to be quite honest, not super regimented, like, you know, disciplined as, as you probably are with a lot of the things that you do. Yeah. So that's the kind of technique that, um, that I wanted to explore with mind hacking and actually try to bring some science to it to say, well, what does the research show on, on, on this kind of technique? And so this study you referred to was really interesting. They had two groups of students, and one of them, they said, we want you to visualize getting good grades in this class. Just visualize the end result. The other group, they said, we want you to simulate the process of getting good grades in your mind. So in other right. words, you got to think about, like, uh, studying. And then you have to think about like a friend comes and asks you to go to a party and how are you going to say no so that you can study? And then you got to, you know, take the test and then getting a good grade on that and getting sleep the night before. So the whole process of getting there. So they consistently found that the students who simulated instead of just did the visualization of the end results, they scored much higher, like a full letter grade higher. And so the results of that were when we're doing when we're trying to think about what we want to accomplish, it is more effective for us to think through the whole process. And what's really great about that, in my experience, and the reason it works is because it forces you to think through not just what's going to (laughs) work, but also what's going to go wrong. Like you're going to run into challenges and problems. And how are you going to successfully overcome those. So if you do that on a regular basis, start simulating that whole process, you you become much more prepared for those difficulties that arise. And you become kind of weirdly confident that like, oh, yeah, I can deal with this because I've already sort of simulated this in my headspace. Right, right. Yeah, that's um that's very interesting. And, and you also, I, I believe that might be the same area where you talk a little bit about the golfer, Jack Nicholas and how he would actually simulate, you know, seeing first the, the ball up on the green, then the stroke that it would take to get him there. And he kind of played it in reverse. And it made me think a little bit of my own grandfather who 
same exact thing. He was a state champion skeet shooter, mm. uh, and he did the exact same thing. He would picture it in his mind, do the whole simulation. So I, I found that that part very helpful for me because, like I just kind of told you, I use this visualization process, but I haven't really run simulation so much. And it does lead me to questions of, you know, if, if I'm imagining there being roadblocks, now am I co-creating those roadblocks in some way? <laughs> and so now you've really got me scratching my head, but I find this like really fascinating uh, distinction that you've made and, and one very worthy of exploring. And, uh, you know, I mean, the grades speak for themselves, like a whole letter grade you know, in the study higher yeah. uh, for the people running simulations, there's something to be said for that. So I, I suppose, and just thinking my way through it as I talk about it, is if you are running the simulations, what are very realistic things that you can expect? Uh, not necessarily road bo- blocks, but challenges and and just, you know, part of the process and processes that it's going to take to get there. And you play those out without giving too much energy to, you know, big major problems that you're co-creating. I suppose it it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you get to a really interesting point. And, and and the question that I had going into it was like, okay, well, if you if you do believe that your thoughts create reality, and they certainly do in the sense that your thoughts do pre- preface your actions and your actions create your reality. So that much right. is indisputable. But if you, you know, buy into the concept of manifesting or manifestation, well, to what extent does that work? So as you just said, if you're visualizing problems, is that going to make the problems appear? So the conclusion I came to is man, just just thinking about something is not going to make it automatically manifest because the simple reason is you have to do the work. Like if right. you can, you know, you can <laughs> you can visualize a million dollars, but a Brinks truck is not going to back up to your house and Absolutely. unload. And I think that's where a lot of the success literature leaves out this really important step of like, you've really got to <laughs> yeah, action. You've got to actually do the work in order for these things to come true. However, when we think about these things, and especially if we do it repetitively, we lay the foundation for those things to happen in our life. We make it easier for ourselves. And as I just said, when you're coming up with solutions for possible problems, there's just a really practical, useful benefit to that, that like you start to become much more confident in your ability to handle those problems when they arise. So I think the long-term strategy that I use and that we recommend in the book, backed by science, is it is helpful (laughs) to visualize that end state, but also it's even more helpful if you're visualizing all the steps that are going to go along the way and letting your imagination explore what those steps will look like. Invariably, they'll look different from your imagination, but it's right. super helpful to run those simulations. Yeah, yeah. And and yeah, you kind of led into what I was going to pick your brain on next, and that is what are your thoughts on, you know, law of attraction and that sort of thing? Because, uh, you know, all these mind hacking techniques, they're requiring and, and utilizing imagination. You actually uh, tell the story of the the guy, I forget his name, uh, the cartoonist who um, made Dilbert, the cartoon Dilbert. And yeah. it was interesting, his kind of perspective uh, in the book that you talk about, he's not mentioning, you know, I instantly thought of it when I was reading, he was approaching it from a very scientific uh, kind of perspective and, and never mentioned anything like frequency or vibration. And I even at the time I jotted a little note to, to bring that up. And then I get later in the book to you, the same quote that I, I, I write down something about frequency and vibration as Tesla, you know, quote, made the quote, if you want to understand the universe, think in terms of frequency right. and vibration or something to that effect. And then lo and behold, a few chapters later, you use the same quote in a different context. So just very curious what your thoughts are. Uh, and, and by the way, I agree with what you're saying. A lot of the stuff out there on law of attraction and, and things like that, they, they're falling short because they're not addressing all the action that's required. But um, yeah, w- what what are your thoughts? If you could go into that a little bit more for me. Yeah, that's we see we were on the same frequency and vibration. That's why. Exactly. <laughs> that's why that happened. Yeah. So the story you're talking about is Scott Adams, the Dilbert cartoonist. And uh, he, he, he tells some really interesting stories in his books about this technique he used of positive affirmations. So 
He was kind of a Dilbert-esque uh, office worker. He's working at this large telecommunications company, and he wanted to be a cartoonist. And he started writing down on a piece of paper every day, 15 times, uh, I, Scott Adams, will become a syndicated cartoonist. And he would just repeat right. that thought, literally writing it down in, the, in this notebook uh, day after day. Now, he backed that up with action. So every day he would also get up at 4.30 a.m. and draw Dilbert and, you know, then go in for a full day of work at his day job where he would get all this great material to put back into the right. comic strip. And he did that for years. Like, for years he did that routine. And over time, you know, not only did he become a successful syndicated cartoonist, arguably he's the most successful syndicated cartoonist on the planet, just in terms of the books sold and the amount of merchandise and so forth. Um, so he tries to deconstruct that. And that's what I really love about his writing is he approaches it like an engineer or like a scientist. And, you know, I, I've read, uh, you know, all the stuff on frequency and vibration as well. And it's true there may be something to that. But I also want to I, I want to like reverse engineer it. And I want to say, right. well, why does it work sometimes and not others? And how can it be more effective? And let's like get some data. Let's have like everybody trying this and sharing their results. That's why I wanted to hear how it's worked for you. I'm always curious to learn from actual data points. So one of the things he says is one of his theories about why this works is that your mind becomes more conditioned to look for possibilities. In other words, if you're repeating every day, like I'm, I'll become a syndicated cartoonist, you start to notice opportunities when they come across your path. You know, if you're saying to yourself, I'm going to get in shape 15 times a day, then when somebody invites you to a kickboxing class, you know, you might normally say, the bell I'm gonna, goes off. Yeah. You're like, hey, that actually could help me on my goal. So you become more optimistic and optimistic people's field of perception is actually greater. Like you actually see more things when you're in that state of mind. So that could be one of the reasons from a scientific perspective why that works. And then also the frequency and vibration. Right, right. I hear you. I hear you. Okay. Um, so you, you did make a very interesting point right there that I found also really helpful. And that is, the power of writing and Scott, uh, you know, Scott Adams, right? That's his yeah. Name? yeah. Scott used would write 15 times a day. And I think that's something that's really interesting. And you talk a lot about that in the book, how, well, instead of me trying to explain it, why don't you, you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. There's a crazy power in writing that we forget how magical it is because we do it so often, but uh, you know, when they study people who, you know, uh, keep their New Year's resolutions, for example, the people who write down their New Year's resolutions are more likely to stick with them for longer. There's a great study in the book about um, these. Uh, they, they took a large number of obese people and one group they just had put on a diet and the other group they had keep a food journal, just write down everything that they wrote. And the people who kept a food journal consistently lost more weight. So the magic of writing things down is it, it gets it out of our heads and into our hands. Like you think about your thoughts <laughs> and they're just so transient. They're so ephemeral. But when you write it down, you're actually making it a thing. Like you're bringing it into the physical world. And it really is a step to like making it a reality. Think about like, you know, the people at a, bar and they get excited about a business plan and they like jot it down on a cocktail napkin. And right. that's that idea of like, this idea is so great. We got to like write it down and get it on paper so we can actually see it. So when we're trying to accomplish these things, writing them down and especially repeating that like Scott Adams did, um, is really proven to to have a, a really powerful effect at helping us actually accomplish those things and make them real. Yeah, it makes me think of you You kept saying, you know, the magic of it. And uh, a friend of mine who actually is going to be on a forthcoming episode, Mark England, he is a 
language empowerment uh, yeah. guy, and and he talks about abracadabra, the Aramaic phrase meaning you know I create as I speak, and that's mm. essentially what you're doing. You're you know we've all heard abracadabra used for magic, but when you look at the actual uh, meaning behind it, it's uh, it's just that there is great power. You know when you're when you speak or using words, you're spelling, you're casting a spell, so to speak. So uh, I, I really enjoyed that part of the book as well. And it's something that uh, a good takeaway for me, because we are on our computers and so, you know, so much. Uh, I think there's, it's great to type it too, but I find even writing, I, I, I did some of that as I went through the book and some of the, the mind games and exercises that you had. And I think that's something that I, I will definitely incorporate more into my, uh, you know, daily regime of, of creating my reality and hacking my mind. Cool. Well, let us know how it goes and how it works. That's what I always want to hear from. I want to hear your success stories. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now you talk about the power of tiny goals. Yeah. Um, I think that was another very important point. Uh, not trying to conquer it all at once, but step by step. And you you brought in some great stories about uh the guy who developed the uh, internet World Wide web. And so maybe you can uh, elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah. So the whole last third of the book is really about this idea of acting and about, you know, we've now prepared our minds and we've made them rich and fertile by reprogramming them. I just totally mix metaphors, by the way, gardening and then programming. <laughs> I don't know what that was all about. But uh, now that your mind, on our toes. <laughs> now that your mind has been prepared, um, you need to act. You got to actually do it. You got to get that out into the real world. And my favorite story actually was uh, was David Blaine, who is you know the magician and oh, yeah. in, endurance artist. You know who does things like seals himself in a you know glass tank or under a block of ice for like two weeks. And in this book, uh, the book's called Willpower, Rediscovering the Greatest Human Strength. Great book. They interviewed David Blaine and I said, like, how do you do those things? Because it's not magic. He literally has to prepare his body for these crazy endurance feeds. Right. And he says, well, in between my stunts, I actually get fat. <laughs> I like <laughs> lose, you know, I gain weight. I drink too much. I get all sloppy. Don't shave. But then when it comes time to train, to prepare, I start making all these tiny goals. And they said, like, for example, you know, I'll get up every day and I'll go run like five miles. And when I run, I, I have to every time I'm running, you know, in the streets of New York City or wherever. And they have one of those crosswalk, uh, the crosswalk things on the on the ground, like the crossing sign mm -hmm. on the on the ground. He has to step on the pedestrian uh, right. But he has to step right on the head of the pedestrian. And if he doesn't do it, he has to come back and do it again. So it's a little OCD in one, in, one, <laughs> in one sense. But in another sense, he says the power of wiring into those tiny goals is that every one of them feeds my larger goal. Every time I like do one of those things, I know I'm going to be able to do this big thing that I'm trying to go out so it comes back to what we're talking about, like your negative loops and your positive loops. When you cut off the energy from those negative loops or start transforming that into these higher level positive loops, you could really start to do amazing things. Work on the tiny actions. And over time, those can grow into really very big actions indeed. Right. Yeah. And I think that's such an important thing for people to consider because you look at your giant, you know, your end goal, it can seem so daunting and Think of how many people have been through the process of thinking, here's where I should be or want to be, and I'm so far removed from it, and I think I'll just stay on the couch and watch, you know, a rerun of Friends or whatever, because yeah. it is just so intimidating. So it's just start somewhere, one step, right? So Yeah, what's the, what's the next best step? That's always a good question to ask, is like, what's the next thing I can do? And it goes back to me throwing out the bottles like it was all about one step at a time, literally one muscle movement at a time. And if you can just focus on that next little action to move you in the direction you want to go over time, you'll get there. Absolutely. Now, in the book, you talk about reality distortion fields pertaining to Steve Jobs, 
who everyone knows, so I don't need to say who that is. Um, and can you explain what that is and how we can create our own reality distortion field? Yeah, it's one of my favorite stories. It comes from uh, the Steve Jobs biography by Walter Isaacson, another great book. And his coworkers said that uh, Jobs had a reality distortion field. And there was the hmm. story of this new programmer who came in. Uh, it was like just before the, the original Macintosh was about to be shipped. And one of the veteran programmers said, uh, we got to do this in, uh, I think it was like 12 weeks. And the programmer said, 12 weeks, that's impossible. And the veteran says, you're going to go into this room with Jobs, and he's going to talk you into it because he has a reality distortion field. And the guy says, what? <laughs> he says, well, it's taken from the Star Trek episode where there are these aliens who can like project <laughs> virtual realities into the minds of other people. And he says, all right, I'll see. So he goes and comes out <laughs> totally convinced he can do it. It totally worked. Yeah. And they actually talked about like, how, how can we shield ourselves? Like they were totally conscious of it, but they still fell under its power, under its spell. And eventually they just accepted it as a force of nature. Well, I believe that all of us within us have the power to create our own reality distortion fields. And it's really a sense of being so convinced that something is possible and possible for us that we're actually able to affect or influence the thoughts of others. And I think that we can really do that when we start to practice these mind hacks and start to get in control of our thinking. We can really start to uh, believe with such a strong power of belief that we can we can literally affect those around us. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think of... Uh you know, well, one of the other things that you talk about is calling others into your story, so to speak, or, or getting others involved and how much more power there is. And I, I think in my own life, something I just started doing and I've referenced before, I think uh, once on the show or twice on the show, you know, in my t late teen, early 20s, I started saying, hey, I don't believe in getting sick. If someone is around me and I've got the flu, stay away, I'll make a point to hug them or shake their hand or whatever, <laughs> because I want to put it in their heads. Yeah, yeah, Brandon doesn't get sick and he's showing that he doesn't get sick. So by announcing it and giving all this energy to it, now it's in their head. Now yes. they're giving energy to it. And you know what? I don't really get sick. Very rarely under certain circumstances, if I'm not sleeping for long periods of time or, you know, I've went in and, and partied or something like that in the past when when I did a lot a lot of that sort of thing it I would run myself down but I rarely rarely get sick and yes. you know it's the same kind of thing I've created my own reality distortion field so oh, Brandon, I, thought, I love that story I'm gonna have to use that and it's true I do the same thing so I uh you know people like don't touch me I have a cold I'm like get over here give me yeah, a hug that's and I funny say, that you do I say the... something ridiculous like I have a force field or I have a shield <laughs> That's or whatever, so funny. or my immune you, system you can hit. Um, and like, uh, I, I got a tick bite. I had a tick. And everybody's like, you had a tick bite? Well, you must have Lyme disease. You have to go to the hospital at once. And I'm like, the tick is going to give me superpowers. And I totally convinced <laughs> myself the tick would give me superpowers. You turned into, t I think I saw, uh, there was a report of a tick man, like going out at night and uh, solving crime. Was that you? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And then at the end, I suck the blood of evildoers. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. I latch myself onto them. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, think about doctors and and people in the medical profession. They're around disease all day long. They're walking literally through halls of disease. Yeah. And are they afraid? They're not afraid because they're doctors and their training has made them immune. I'm not being silly. I'm being literal. Like the training actually has said, I am a doctor and therefore I'm above this. Now, do doctors get sick? Of course they get sick. Just like Brandon gets sick and I get sick occasionally, but very yeah. rarely, rarely, right. rarely right. do we get sick because we walk around with that attitude. And then you see the people who are always sick. We all know those people who yeah. it's like their pastime to talk at dinner about what ailment the family has. And, you know, it just feeds and feeds and feeds. And so it's, uh, 
you know, it's just, a, it's interesting. You can take it one way or the other. So you might as well be healthy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, at my age, I'm middle-aged and, you know, I've got friends now who are like, Oh, I'm getting old. And they like talking about their ailments and their problems. And I'm like, yeah. uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm aging, but I don't see it as like, I'm getting old and I don't talk about those things. And consequently they don't bother me as much. It's nice. You know, I'm, uh, about 95% done with a book. Uh, my first book is called The Fountain of You, and it is uh, all about the subject. How that's great. age, you know, how we're, when you take an understanding of how to, well, in your case, hack your mind or the ultimate nature of reality and how things work to create your own reality and combine that with all, all the advancements in technology and science that are happening right now, we're, it's birthing us into the age of timelessness, I believe. And that's really what it's about is like you're create, you know, a hundred years from now, you and I could be having our 25th podcast together and, uh, looking and feeling better than we do now. So that's, <laughs> that's how I choose to view the world. And that's, you know, as a result, I'm, I, people are always surprised at my age, people, you know, I'm like I said, I'm never sick and I'm really creating that reality for myself. And, so. and you're 92 years old. That's the thing I can't. Yeah, yeah, right. I know. I know. It's it's incredible. I know. <laughs> so, so, when is when is your book? At? Let's plug your book for a while. The Fountain yeah, of You. you know That's what? a great title. I, yeah, it is, huh? I'm, I'm, I, I like the title. I'm, I'm pretty pleased with it. It actually originally was going to be forty is the new twenty. I just turned forty. Um, well, I'm coming close to forty one now. But uh, yeah. Uh, so I thought, you know what? That's a little isolating for those who are, you know, twenty five or sixty five because it's really not about that. I just, when I was inspired to write the book, the idea was, okay, I'm about to turn forty. I want to approach everything as if I'm turning twenty. I feel great, you know better than ever. I feel like I'm, you know, looking good, feeling good. Um, all the things that are happening with science and technology, you know, is, are very, very encouraging. You, know, you hear top scientists talking about the first person to live to 150 healthily being in their, you know, 60s or whatever now. And you hear even other people talking about us living well beyond that into the thousands. So who knows? I think it's all possible uh, where it's such a exponential growth rate that is happening on the planet with, with our you know, level of comprehension and, uh, as to how to hack our reality. Right. And so, uh, so yeah, that was my inspiration is wanting to approach everything. Would I learn this instrument if I'm turning 20 instead of 40, would I, you know, do this, would I do that? And that's where the original inspiration. And then, you know, I just started putting the pieces together and, and, you know, researching what's out there science wise, talking a little bit about my, my kind of perspective on creating your reality and the, the, with very, very spiritual leanings in my, in my case, and, um, yeah, so that's, uh, probably about 95% complete with the book and actually had a co-author helping me with it because I was running a company up until a few months ago, I was running a company, uh, that I founded called resort share and it was taking all my time and energy. And I really wanted to write this book, but I didn't have a lot of free time to do it. Uh, so I had someone come in a very close friend of mine to kind of work with me and I would talk a lot about things. We'd spend sessions together and then he'd write them down. And now my time's been freed up and, uh, I'm, you know, doing a lot of the actual writing with him. So probably sometime in the next year, uh, six months to a year, I'll actually try and do something with it. The idea was I was going to get this podcast really going. I'm only a few months into doing this and, and, have people to put it out there too. So this leads me to my next question, uh, or well, I was going to ask it in a little bit, but I love your idea of, of how you're releasing the book. And maybe we'll hold off on that for a moment because I have a few more um, topics that I want to I want to talk about. And I have, in the something, book. I have something to say on the topic of your book, which is I'm going to talk right directly to you, the listener. And I'm going to say, this is a lot of work to put together this podcast. Brandon, Spends a lot of time. He's got to line up guests. He's got to record. He's got to edit it, publish it, promote it. it. Takes a lot of time. All you have to do is buy twelve copies of his book to thank him. That's it. <laughs> and this book is released. Twelve or more copies. That's how you can repay him for all the work I, I, he's done. Like giving you this great content <laughs> for free. Oh, that's so great. Uh, remind me to have you back on when I release the book so you can <laughs> remind everyone about the 12 copies that they're supposed to buy. Um, <laughs> but back to your book. Um, that was a squirrel, right? Um, <laughs> which is something you talk about in the book, becoming aware of distractions, um, 
that break your concentration. I'm assuming that there's some very common issues that you come across for people like I, I need to lose weight or I'm trying to start a business. Do you have any, you know, for, for those really common issues, do you have specific hacks that work? I guess, I guess that's a good way to put it. Is there specific hacks that work for specific issues better than others? Well, for all the hacks, anything you want to achieve in life, the the fundamentals are the same. It, it really is about becoming aware of your mind and, 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 first of all, being able to see it. Then looking at the negative thought loop. So what's holding you back? Why haven't you done this today? What is the thing you're telling yourself that is keeping you from getting to that goal? And once you've debugged that, then it's about crafting your positive loop. And it's it's about figuring out what it is you do want. We, we all know what we don't want, but very few of us have actually thought through, well, here's, here's what I want. And the idea of, of figuring out those positive loops, we have a couple of mind games in the book, um, uh, which are basically sort of like thought experiments. So one of them is, for example, um, that <laughs> you, you collect antique lamps because mm -hmm. you are hoping to eventually one day find a genie in one of them. So you go to all these Middle Eastern bazaars and you collect as many lamps as you can. And then one day you come home with your shopping bag full of lamps and you luck out because not one but two of the lamps have genies. What are the odds? So <laughs> you know the genie are crafty. So you basically... <laughs> say to the one genie, I wish that you would make the other genie keep his word. And now you have one ah. wish left. So the question is, what would you do with that wish? What is it? What is it that you would want to do, be, have, accomplish in your life? And putting that down to a word. So if you can come up with the word of what that thing is, that can be the seed of that positive loop that you can use to then repeat and actually accomplish accomplish that thing. So, uh, so whatever it is, it's it's really all about articulating what it is you want in an elegant way that you can turn into a positive thought loop. Awesome. Now, the book is currently free uh, online. Correct? It's 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 being released on uh, a major publisher, Simon & Schuster, in January. Is that correct? Yeah, so it'll be in bookstores everywhere in January 2016. You can also uh, get a pre-order it in, at Amazon right now, and uh, I'm sure we'll have a link in the show notes. However, you can also get a pre-release copy. So we're kind of open-sourcing the book in the spirit of open-source software, and uh, you can get it at mindhacky.ng. So that's mindhacking with a dot ng instead of dot com. And it's really allowed this mind hacking program to become a movement because we've had thousands of beta testers and readers who have uh, who are using this program have come through, given us feedback, use the app that we have available. And it's just been a, a terrific way of, of building this community. That's awesome. So was this, so this idea of releasing it and allowing people and just to specify, and we will put it in the notes when we release the, uh, the podcast, but, um, people can go to mind hacking and it's, uh, you basically it's mind hacky.ng. So you go there, right. you can get the book for free. And w now I love this idea, by the way, and it's one that I considered and and w am going to probably do take do something similar. Was the was the idea inspired by uh, by chance by Seth Godin's Unleashing the Idea Virus book? Do you know about that? I have heard about it. I have not read it. Um, there are a number of authors who have done this, where they've had a a version, you know, online um, and uh, then had a traditionally published version as well. And uh, by and large, those books have done well. They've done well. Yeah. And, you know, one of my favorite authors uh, who has done this said, you know, it's it's not about like 
what I'm interested in is getting more people into the tent. You know, it's not about making sure that everybody in the tent has paid a ticket to be there. And I think that's very much the economy. You know, we all expect content to be free now and you kind of have to do that. But also by making it free, you can get these ideas out to the largest audience possible. And that's what I want to do. I really want, I want people to benefit from this. Right. Right. Awesome. So to a question that I always like to ask, as my audience knows, I love stories of synchronicity or serendipity uh, or, or abracadabra, real magic, (laughs) something that has uh, happened that has led you to uh, even perhaps maybe you have a a story that is uh, ties into the writing of this book. Do you have a, a good story for us? I do. I do. Awesome. These things happen to me all the time. And I think they're they're kind of like signs that you're on the right track when you see those synchronicities I, happening. I agree. Um, <laughs> so when we were pitching this book, I had written the first few chapters of Mind Hacking and we were shopping it around to um, to publishers in New York. And I'm I go into Simon and Schuster and the publisher was there and a couple other people and I'm with my agent and the publisher starts gushing about the book. She's like, this is exactly what I need to read at this point in my life. It's terrific. You're such a great writer. And I'm feeling at this point, like this, I think is the high point of my entire life. Sure. (laughs) sure. I'm thinking, forget the birth of my kids. This is it right now. This ego gratification. (laughs) Right. Right. It really felt good. And I'm like, well, thank you. That's that's very kind. And she says, you know, we're really interested in doing this. And um, and the editor that we're interested in having work on this is this gentleman by the name of Jeremy Ruby Strauss. And um, John, Jeremy, and she and Jeremy's over on the other side of the table. And Jeremy says, yeah, I, I, I know John <laughs> because I was the editor for his last two books. So... <laughs> Oh, totally wow. coincidentally, she had How no funny. idea that Jeremy and I had this whole backstory and had worked on these books together. And uh, uh, he happened to now be at Simon & Schuster and happened to be there. And it was just complete coincidence. But when those things happen, you're like, OK, that's meant to be. That's we're going to yeah. do that. Yeah. <laughs> we're going in that direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I might just be on the right track here. Well, uh, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing. So. This has been really, really awesome. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, educate us all about mind hacking. And I look f- very much forward to following the book as you know as you actually release it uh, next year. And I, I, I'll make sure to put it on uh, the liner notes and so forth when we release this podcast. Guys, definitely highly recommended. Go check out uh, mindhacky.ng. Get your free copy. Well worth the time. Very uh, amusing. A lot of uh, great humor uh, interjected as well. So uh, yeah, definitely go do that. One last question. I like to put everyone on the spot just a little bit. And this question, John, what is the meaning of life to Sir John Hargrave? (laughs) In the last 30 seconds of the podcast. I got to get you at some point. (laughs) What is the meaning of life? Well, Brandon, I think the meaning of life, uh, let me let me put it this way. I think the purpose of life is to learn. We're here to yeah. learn. This is like school. This is like the greatest school you could possibly imagine. It's this crazy 3D immersive virtual reality <laughs> sense around with full on THX <laughs> Oculus Rift learning experience. And <laughs> that's why we're here is to gain knowledge to grow as humans and as beings and to hopefully leave a little bit stronger and wiser than when we came. Well said, John. Well said. Well, everyone, that concludes our podcast for this week. John, you've been a spectacular guest. Thanks so much for joining me for this super informative discussion. All of you out there listening, remember to subscribe to the show on iTunes. Give us a good review while you're at it. Uh, Also, be sure to check out our new t-shirt designs at positivehead.com. They turned out really, really great. Uh, Otherwise, until next time, remember, as long as you ain't dead, you're already positive ahead. Be well, everyone.